<laughs> All right, I'm happy to be here on uh, Mother's Day. I'm happy that, to see that you guys do this baby bottle campaign. Um, I, I wasn't aware that, that you did it, but I'm so happy to see it because I know that uh, they make a great difference. The fact that they have a, an ultrasound machine now, I, I've read that that makes a significant difference. Like if a mother sees the baby, they are so less likely to to go through with an abortion. So uh, the fact that you're doing this is, is wonderful. The fact that you're doing it on Mother's Day uh, is, is that much more wonderful. So, so thank you for doing that. Uh, happy Mother's Day to everyone who's here. Uh, happy Mother's Day to the mothers who are with us, to those of you who are grandmothers or great-grandmothers or uh, those of you who are married to mothers or those of you who have mothers, uh, happy Mother's Day to you. I think that covers everyone. Uh, happy Mother's Day. I, uh, today I want to cover a passage from a love letter. And uh, this love within this love letter, uh, somebody mentions one of... It's a love letter to a friend. It's, it's not a romantic love letter. It's a love letter to a friend from a time whenever it was okay to express your love to a friend. Um, now, especially between males. You can't do that as much anymore. But at one time, men could tell other men that they cared, uh, they cared about them and not in a romantic way. And, and I, I want to cover that. But within the context of this love letter, one man tells another man about the uh, uh, about uh, his his gratefulness for this other man's mother and his grandmother. And uh, so I think it's a good passage to focus on on Mother's Day. And that, uh, that letter is 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy is really a, a love letter from, from Paul to Timothy. So we're going to look at 2 Timothy, and we're going to look at verse, uh, chapter 1, verses 3 through 5 today. So t 2 Timothy, chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. And what this says is, I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother, Lois, and in your mother, Eunice, and now, I'm sure, dwells in you as well. And uh, whenever we read this, I want us to think about the context in which this letter was written. Um, the Apostle Paul is writing this to his friend Timothy at the end of his life from a prison cell. Now, I've been to jail several times. Um, no, it's not what you're thinking. <laughs> um, I, I actually do jail ministry with my church, so I'm in jail regularly, um, bringing the gospel message to people in jail. Um, but from doing that, I have gotten to know some of the people who are in jail. And one of the things that they'll tell me is that when you're in jail, you often lose touch with a lot of your friends. Like a lot of your friends will abandon you. They will, they will leave you. They will uh, head, head elsewhere. And um, that actually happened to Paul. A lot of his, Paul's friends abandoned him whenever he was in prison. And not only did they abandon Paul, but more significantly, they abandoned the gospel message that he taught them. And Paul was concerned about this, but Timothy, his, his good friend um, from the Ephesian church, Timothy did not abandon him. Timothy stayed loyal to him. And again, more importantly, Timothy stayed loyal to the gospel message. And Paul was writing this letter to encourage Timothy in, in, in that, in that he, was, he was faithful. So verse 3 says, I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. And I, I, whenever I read this, I, I am thinking of Paul sitting in prison. And it's not one of these luxury jails either. This is, a, this is a first century jail. So you can imagine it's not a very comfortable place to be. And he's writing to his friend Timothy. And he's saying, I'm praying for you, Timothy. And I'm thinking, you know, probably I would think Paul is the one in need of prayers here, right? He's the one who's in a miserable situation. 
Timothy is a, a leader of a church, a growing church, one of the better churches at the time. Um, you, you think that Timothy should be the one praying for Paul, but he has it, he has it the other way around. Paul is constantly praying for Timothy. And that's a good reminder that we're all in need of prayers and we could all use prayers from anybody. Like, no matter what lot in life you're in, you could be praying for somebody else. Uh, Paul was sitting there in miserable condition in a prison praying for his, his friend Timothy. Um, so so he, he, t lets Paul, he lets Timothy know that he's praying for them. Um, and next he shares a memory. He says, as I remember your tears, I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. And memories are a great way to encourage one another. I've been to a lot of funerals, as I'm sure most of you have been to a lot of funerals. And no matter whose funeral you go to, one thing that's constant at a funeral is the sharing of memories. We like to share memories with one another. And here... Paul is sharing a memory with, with Timothy. Um, he, I think the memory that he's sharing comes from Acts chapter 20. Um, in Acts chapter 20, Paul is saying goodbye to the Ephesian church. And, um, and it says, uh, Acts chapter 20, verses 37 through 40, it says, And there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful most of all because of the word he had spoken, that they would not see his face again. And they accompanied him to the ship. And Paul says in, in what we're reading today out of Second Timothy, is I remember your tears. So he's remembering this situation where they're saying goodbye. And it's in this memory that he's, he's reminded whenever he says, I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I'm sure dwells in you as well. So he's remembering this situation, and that somehow reminds him of Timothy's mother and grandmother. Um, so on this Mother's Day, I really want to focus on that, on that memory that Paul's sharing to Timothy of his mother and grandmother. And there are several observations I want to make about this memory that he has of his grandmother and mother. First, Christians, Christian mothers and fathers have a great mission field in their own home. Christian mothers and fathers have a great mission field in their own home. Timothy's faith was passed from generation to generation. We see this here. We see that Timothy's mother and grandmother kept passing down that faith. Um, in this same letter, a couple chapters down, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, Paul writes, And how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, in Christ Jesus. The reason that whenever Paul shared the gospel with Timothy, one of the reasons that Timothy was able to accept it was because from a young age, he was acquainted with scripture. His mother and grandmother put scripture in front of him from a young age. And we know it was his mother and grandmother. His, his uh, father was not Jewish, but his, his mother and grandmother were, and they acquainted him with scripture from a very young age. So uh, we often pray for opportunities to share the gospel. Um, if we don't, we probably should be praying for opportunities to share the gospel, right? It's, it's something that we pray for regularly, but sometimes God answers those prayers and we miss them. If you are a parent, God has answered the prayer of an opportunity for you to share the gospel. You have a captive audience right there in your children. Like, if you're sharing the gospel at work, there's a chance this person's going to turn around and, and walk away. Oh, they're talking about Jesus again. Um, but if you're uh, sharing the gospel with your kids, they can until they're in their teenage years, <laughs> they're not going to be able to walk away as much. So uh, you have a great opportunity to, to share the gospel with your children. So share the gospel with your children. Share the gospel with other people's children. Share the gospel with grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Share the gospel with them and share it multiple times. Because kids need to hear things multiple times. If you have par uh, um, uh, we have lots of parents in the room, and uh, I'm sure you know that uh, when the kids are young and you tell them to brush your teeth, telling them once is not going to cut it. 
Telling them twice is not going to cut it. Telling them 25 times in a single night might be what you need to do to get your kids to brush your teeth. And we're willing to do that, right? We, we, we know that good dental hygiene is important, so we're willing to tell our kids 25 times that they need to brush their teeth. But how long are our teeth going to last? Right? It, even if you have a really good set of teeth and you take good care of them, they last, what, like 70, 75 years, um, and then you replace them with dentures. Uh, but your soul is going to last for eternity. So if it's worth telling somebody 25 times to brush their teeth, it's worth telling them inf infinite more times about Jesus and about the gospel of Jesus. So um, on this Mother's Day, I'm thankful for all the mothers here who do that, all the grandmothers here who have done that, but fathers and aunts and uncles who have done that as well. That's awesome. That's, uh, that's an answered prayer is whenever we're praying for, uh, for an opportunity to share the gospel. So you can have the, these opportunities to share the gospel in specific times. Um, I know we used to, at, at dinner, we used to have conversations about um, specifically what we would do is we'd just pick a book of the Bible and go throw it at dinner. And each night I'd read a little section of it and I'd ask the family, um, well, what's this say about God? What does this say about man? What does this say about grace? And how then shall we respond? And those are the four questions I ask all the time. So I didn't need like a devotional book. I didn't need any, any resources. I just needed a Bible and my family. And it was a good opportunity to, to share the, the gospel. So um, specific times to share the gospel is good, but also the other times, non-dedicated times, just weave that gospel message in everything that you do. Uh, and again, not only those of you with kids, but those of you who are around kids, uh, share the, that gospel message with them. Um, I, I, you notice here that in, in what we're reading here, here the main passage, uh, Paul mentions both Lois and Eunice, both a mother and a grandmother. So grand, grandparents clearly have, have an important role to play here, but I think everybody does. If we go all the way back to Deuteronomy um, chapter 11, verse 19, Moses is, is talking to, to the people of Israel, and he says, you shall teach them, and the them here is these words, you shall teach this, this message that I'm giving you. You shall teach these words to your children, talking of them when you are sitting in your house and when you're walking by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. So he was talking to parents here, but he was also talking to the entire nation of Israel. Whenever he said, you shall teach these to your children, he was talking to the nation of Israel and saying, your children, like the children who live in your nation, you should be teaching these things to. And we, as Christians, are the new nation of Israel. So we need to be teaching these things to our children. And when do we teach them? Well, he says, um, when you're sitting in, the, in your house, when you're walking by the way, when you lie down, when you rise. So all the time. Right? So yeah, when you're driving in your car, when you're uh, out for a walk with your kids, whenever you're uh, doing whatever it is you're doing, you shall be sharing the gospel. So, so my first observation here is that Christians, Christian mother and fathers have a great mission field in their own home. My second one is that Lois and Eunice's and Timothy's faith was a sincere faith. It's, Paul writes, I am reminded of your sincere faith. And this makes me wonder, if there's a such thing as a sincere faith, is there a such thing as an insincere faith? So is it possible to have an insincere faith? Well, in another letter that Paul wrote to Timothy and his entire church in Ephesians uh, 2.8, Paul writes, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God. 
Now, God doesn't give broken gifts, does he? Like, I, uh, my, my kids and I got my wife a, a gift this morning for Mother's Day, and she opened it up, and we forgot the batteries. <laughs> Uh, um, so God doesn't forget the batteries in the gifts that he gives. The gifts that God gives work. So if your faith is a gift from God, your faith works. God's not going to give you a broken, uh, broken gift. So any of those gifts that are a gift from God are a sincere gift. They, they do have sincere faith. But the Bible does mention an insincere faith. And one of my favorite passages on an insincere faith comes from the book of James. In James chapter 2, verses 14 through 19. It says, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one? You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. So um, this, is a, this is a controversial passage for uh, a lot of people because they think that maybe, J maybe James is saying that faith cannot save here, but that's not what he's saying. If you read carefully, he says, can that faith save? What faith? That dead faith, that faith that's insincere. Can that faith save? No, because that's not the faith. That's a faith that's not working. And God doesn't give gifts that don't work. So uh, he's saying that, that a broken faith cannot save. Um, and, and here, uh, something else to note is that faith is more than belief. We see this here with, with what he's saying about the demons. He says, even de demons believe and they shudder like they're scared. They're, they're scared of this, uh, of this belief that, that they have. Uh, Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Faith is hope. Do demons have hope? Demons don't have hope. There's no hope for a demon. If you're a demon, I mean, there's no hope for you at all. Like, like you know this truth, and you know you're on the losing side. That's got to be a miserable existence. Yeah, because you know, you believe, and you know you're on the losing side. There's no hope there. Um, and the conviction of things seen. Are, are demons convicted of anything? No, they, they don't have a conviction. Hope and conviction leads to changes of heart. And a sincere faith is going to lead to a change of heart. That's going to change our heart completely. It's going to change how we behave. It's going to change how we live. It's going to change everything about us. So I wonder, how did Paul know that Timothy's faith and Lois's faith and Eunice's faith, how did he know that they had a sincere faith? Well, part of the answer is that he was inspired by the Holy Spirit, so he wasn't going to be wrong. But I think more, more significantly is, or uh, more significantly for us, is that he saw their faith. He saw their faith in the way it was displayed, the way they acted towards one another. He could tell that it was his sincere faith because they demonstrated their faith. Um, so I want us to, to think about, are there two versions of you? Is there a version of you, like the Sunday morning version of you, and the every other day version of you? Um, if, if that's the case, you might want to check your faith. Is your faith sincere? Is there a out in public version of you that most people see, and then an at home version of you that your family sees? If that's the case, you might want to check your faith because uh, if, if Eunice and Lois would have put on a display for the public and acted differently at home, Timothy would have seen that and it would have affected Timothy. So you want to make sure that, that your faith is sincere. Um, 
uh, 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. So we're ambassadors. Ambassadors are people who live in one culture while representing another culture. So we live in the culture of this world while representing the culture of Christ. If we're insincere of that, we're being bad witnesses to our neighbors. So be sincere in your faith. Be consistent in your faith. Allow it to affect you whenever, wherever you are. So my second observation is that we need a sincere faith. Third observation here is that honoring your father and mother means more than obeying them. When, we, uh, when we're in Sunday school as kids and we're taught about the Ten Commandments and we're taught, honor thy father and mother, what are we taught? We're taught, obey your parents, right? That's, that's what we're taught is honor your father and mother means obey your parents. And I'm not letting you all kids off the hook here. Um, honoring your father and mother does mean obeying your parents because uh, that's a necessary part of, of honoring your parents. But it's not all that it means. Um, Paul's honoring Lois and Eunice here, right? We can see that. We can read and see that Paul is honoring Timothy's parents. Is he obeying them? Well, no, there's no, like, I, I can't imagine that Lois got on the, on the telephone and called Paul in prison and was like, Paul, I think you need to write a letter to my son Timothy because no, he's not obey, obeying them, but he's honoring them. He's honoring them and the, the, the words he's saying to them. Um, so he's, he's treating them with honor. And that's how you honor someone. Um, in a, at one time, names were important. Surnames were important. Last names were important. It was something that, that uh, whenever we had smaller communities, people knew each other by their surnames. So I came from a small town. Um, Terry knows the town that I came from. Uh, a very small town, much like New Bethlehem, where, uh, where names meant something. Like my uh, uncle owned the drugstore in town. It was called the Thomas Drugstore. My parents owned an auto store. Um, some of my uncles were, were doctors, so they were the Dr. Thomas. So whenever I was out and about, I was representing the name Thomas. And my parents let me know that. That whenever you're out, you are representing our family. Make sure you do that honorably. So I think that our, as our communities get wider, with um, even, if, even if the community itself is shrinking, the fact that we have internet communication, things like that, our communities are broadening. I think with that, we're losing some of that significance of our names. And I'm, I, I think that we don't want to lose the honor that goes with your name. So treat your name honorably. And that's a way you honor your parents. It's, it's more than just obeying them. So observation three is that honoring your father and mother means more than obeying. Observation four, Christians need to encourage one another and we can encourage one another through the gospel. The gospel is a great way to encourage one another. In, in this passage, we already talked about how, how Paul reminded Timothy of the past. He reminded him of the past. But he also reminds him of the future. If we look down a few, uh, a few verses that follow this section, we see a therefore. And last week, whenever I, I talked about therefore, I said, when we see a therefore in the Bible, we need to ask, what's it there for? It connects two ideas. So today it's going to connect this idea of Paul encouraging Timothy to an idea of what does Timothy do because Paul is in encouraging him. If, if we accept this encouragement is true, then how shall we respond? And we see it there in verse 8 with a therefore. And then we were going to go all the way to verse 12 because this is all one sentence. Paul likes to write really long sentences. Um, I'm, I'm sure he uh, would have gotten some dings, some points in his English class for, from, his, uh, from his English teacher for writing run-ons. But this is all one sentence. Uh, listen to this sentence carefully. It says, 
Therefore, so if all of this stuff that I'm saying is an encouragement is true, therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in, in suffering for the gospel by the power of God who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which now has been manifested through the, the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do." Wow, that's a long sentence. And in that sentence is the gospel. So Paul is sharing the gospel with Timothy. That, that sentence could have like a whole sermon series preached on it. But I just want us to think about the fact that this is the gospel message. This is it, that we're saved by grace through faith, that Jesus abolished death and brought us life. This is a gospel message. Timothy already knew the gospel. Timothy was a leader in his church. He already knew the gospel. So we sometimes think that the gospel is something we share with people to get them saved. And then we move on to other things. That's not what Paul thought. Paul thought, I need to remind Christians of the gospel all the time. The gospel is like a steak. Right? It's delicious. Like the first time you have a steak... You're not going to be like, oh, well, that's nice. Let's, let me move on to other things. No, you're going to keep coming back for more and more steak because steak is delicious. The gospel is delicious to the Christian. It's something that we hunger for. It's something that we strive for. It's something that makes our spiritual mouth water. We want more and more of it. So the gospel is something that we need to encourage one another with all the time. So we shouldn't just be looking to the past but also looking to the future because the future is where our hope is. Our hope is, is in the gospel message and the gospel allows us to do that. And fi my final observation today is that you cannot inherit salvation. I watch a lot of forensic files. Um, I am like the 0.02% of their audience that's male, because normally it's women. And you can tell by their advertisements that it's mainly women who watch the show. And um, so I'm confessing to you guys right now that I am like the 0.2% of the forensic file audience who's male. And um, I love the science there. Like they're always looking at DNA evidence and they're piecing little pieces of a puzzle together and they're solving a puzzle. I love it. But as much as I've watched it and I've seen them analyze DNA, they've never looked under the microscope and then looked at that piece of DNA and said, well, we can tell from this marker right here of this DNA that this person was a Christian. It ne never once have, have I seen them looking at the DNA and have been able to identify um, them identify that it's a Christian. Um, Paul, write, or Paul writes, I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I'm sure dwells in you as well. Something that I notice that's missing here is that Paul does not remind Timothy that he's a descendant of Abraham or that he's a descendant of Israel. That's quite common in the Bible, isn't it? that they remind people that they're descendants of Israel and Abraham. But he doesn't say that because this is a new testament. This is a new covenant. This covenant is through faith, not through flesh. So it's not something that can be inherited. Romans 9, 6b through 8 says, For not all who are descendant from Israel belong to Israel. And not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. 
So we inherit salvation, we get salvation through faith, not through inheritance. I used to work for a polling firm. We used to do political polls. Um, so we were the people who, who would call people and ask them who they were going to vote for, for president. I didn't work there in uh, 2016, so I wasn't the one who got all these polls about the Trump presidency wrong. Um, but uh, it was way before then. But one of the questions we would always ask is, what's your religion? And, and it never fails you to get people who would answer like this. Well, I grew up as a, in a Catholic family, so I guess I'm Catholic. Or, my whole family is Baptist, so I guess I'm Baptist. Or, we were all Methodists growing up, so we're Methodist. But when I hear that, I, I, I think of, of that old commercial with, uh, where, where the old ladies are sitting there and they're sharing things on, the, on their living room wall, thinking that it's like Facebook, they're, they're posting things on their Facebook wall, but it's, it's really just their living room wall. And finally, the one old lady stands up and says, that's not how this works. That's not how any of this works. And that's what I think whenever people think that, oh, well, I'm, I'm Christian because my family's Christian. That's not how this works. That's not how any of this works. You cannot inherit salvation. Uh, you need your sincere faith. So if you have not put your faith in Christ yet, do it. Do it now because you can't, don't count on it being in your DNA. It's not in your DNA. Um, but uh, if you have put your faith in Christ, make sure you have a sincere faith like Lois, like Eunice, like Timothy. A faith that somebody like Paul could see that you have. Um, share that faith with your children. It's the most important thing. On this Mother's Day, mothers and fathers in here, it's the most important thing you can share with your children is the faith in Christ Jesus. And honor your father and mother, not with just uh, obedience, but by the way you live your life. Make it be honorable. And most significantly, by being a child of the promise so that you're part of that nation of Israel. Because I can think of nothing more honorable to me than one day knowing that I would have children standing before the throne of grace and God saying to them, well done, my good and faithful servant. I cannot think of anything that could be more honoring to me as a parent than having kids at that faith. So um, with that, honor your, your father and mother on this Mother's Day, and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for an opportunity here to uh, be here in, with, with your church on this Mother's Day. We're thankful that you put mo mothers in our lives, mothers who uh, will let, uh, help us to come to an understanding of you. We ask that you provide all of us with a sincere faith, a faith that can be seen by others. We ask that you help us to honor our father and mothers, Lord. We ask that you uh, allow us to honor them by standing with you in heaven one day, by keeping us strong, by allowing us to run this race and to finish this race. And we thank you for, the, through, for your son, Christ Jesus, who allowed us that opportunity to run this race, who allowed us to have that faith, who allowed us to be saved, who abolished death for us and gave us life. And it's in his, Jesus's most holy name that we pray. Amen.